apologies in advance. <laughs> okay, great, 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 great. Okay, cool. Um, well, welcome again. Uh, I see some familiar faces. I see a couple people I have a uh, first time here, so welcome to you all. Um, this is, uh, I guess, like I said, the third of my series of magical talks. Uh, this one I've entitled Magic 201. Meaning, if you can build off what we had covered in the previous two lectures, in theory, now that you're, you're established enough that you can actually start to do stuff. Which is what we're going to do today. Today is all about the stuff you can do. Um, so, uh, before I really get into this, I just want, I just want to thank uh, you guys, the Theosophical Society, uh, for, for giving me this opportunity. I feel very humbled to have been asked to uh, share what I can with you, and uh, in particular, I feel sometimes that perhaps I'm the greatest beneficiary of these lectures because they make me review everything that I know, they make me uh, focus on the places where my work still needs focus, and it mostly makes me double check my work before I tell you anything. <laughs> so, um, now, um, uh, before we go on, uh, just the, like I said, the, the uh, purpose of this class or more to the point, um, toward the second part of this lecture is actually going to be a ritual. We're going to be doing ritual work together. And I brought all my stuff and we're going to do a big old thing. It's going to be fun. Um, but so what I want you guys to think about as this class progresses is um, I want you to think about today, right? You know, even right now, um, I want you to think about something that you want to accomplish magically. Um, the way I have this structured, there's, um, there's no wrong answer. Uh, there's, uh, in theory, what you'll be able to do is build off successes that I've already worked into this working. And, that, um, and we'll, we'll get into that a little more as we go on. Um, but really what you would probably want to start with or start thinking about right now is concocting your statement of intent. Statement of intent is very important in magical practice. And we'll get into it a little bit more, but essentially... Uh, it would be the way that you would, essentially, the spell you would be doing with it. Spell has its roots in actually spelling words, and so, for instance, it is my will to, etc. Whatever. Whatever it is that you want to accomplish, either something to bring into your life, something to take out of your life, and we'll cover this stuff more as we go through, so don't, don't worry about it. Just think about what it is that you'd like, um, and, or you'd like to accomplish, and you can build off the successes that I've already worked into this working. So, um, now, also, just so that you're aware, um, I think we covered this a little bit last time, but as we said, there are planetary days and planetary hours. Again, today is Sunday, so today is the day of the sun. I'm wearing gold. I wanted to try to uh, get in touch with all this solar stuff that we're going to be doing today. But specifically, the hour of the sun starts at 2.11 today. So I would like, and it ends at two or three twenty-three. So I'd like to make sure that we have started and ended our ritual between those times. So uh, if you guys can keep me on task and make sure that I don't run past like two fifteen or something so that I can get everything set up and ready to go so that we can start. So anyway, um, so that's just a little bit, um, for your, your prep work. And again, if you cannot think of something statement of intent wise that you want to accomplish, then come up with something bizarre. Something to just prove to yourself that, you know, and again, there's some theories in the idea of, of lust for result and where you don't really want to spend your time thinking about something once you're done working on it magically. But like, for instance, you can just, you know, it is my will to see something weird and random. Um, that's another way that you can still have successful magic, prove to yourself that it works, without you really needing to get all hung up on something that's like really, really important to you. So my point is, you can just, you can think about it that way as well. Um, now, <laughs> I have a lot to cover today, uh, and I'm gonna try to get through it as quickly as I can. Well, you know, um, but while last classes were more of the theoretical stuff, uh, uh, mentalism notwithstanding, because that's the most important first and last uh, discipline that you'll develop when we cover. We talked about mentalism a lot, um, but uh, with this stuff, um, I do feel like I need to clarify a few points, both um, and maybe review a few things 
the co concepts that we had touched on previously before we go on. Uh, but again, I feel the need to reiterate that I am not an expert. I feel like I understand this stuff and I have had successes in my own life. That does not mean to say that, you know, you can take what, I, what I've told you and that's enough. I would hope that everyone would consider this to be sort of a stepping stone for your own spiritual adventure, whatever that, whatever that is for you. Uh, and that this, hopefully you'll find something in my talks that tweaks your interest and you go from there. Um, but um, I am all, all right, so another thing that's probably worth uh, discussing is I am well, 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 well aware of how important pronunciation is to certain magicians. Especially in terms of, like, and, uh, again, um, my biggest failing, I suppose, is a lot of these uh, terms I encountered first time reading, so I gave them my own pronunciation in my head, and then you go on and you hear that it's pronounced a different way. Uh, so, like, for instance, I say Tipareth, I know it's Tipareth. I say Malkuth, I know it's Malkut. Like, there's all this stuff like that, and I hope that you would, I suppose, I, Forgive me a little bit, uh, but also understand that no matter what, we're all fractured imperfections in the first place. Uh, so actually, the best way to describe this, I'll, I'll use a little uh, little story metaphor that was told to me. Uh, this has been credited to uh, Lon Milo Decat, who is uh, one of the foremost dilemmic thinkers um, currently living. Um, and uh, he, he had this great story. That, that I loved. He, so he used this metaphor. It's like, imagine you were like sitting at the breakfast table or something, just minding your own business, weren't paying attention to anything, and all of a sudden, a little mouse popped up on your shoe and stood on his hind legs and started to sing your favorite song. <laughs> right? Would your reaction be, wow, you're really off key. <laughs> you're really out of tune. That's not how you sing that song. Or would you just be blown away that this little mouse like was trying? Right? He's trying. Just doing his best to sing that little, your favorite song. Because you don't sing your favorite song perfectly either. And so that's kind of how you could think about it. And we think about angels and gods and higher spirits and stuff like that. That's what we're doing. We're mice. Standing on your shoe, trying to say the words right, but we don't always and whatever. And ultimately, it's not about, well, I think that there is a degree of importance to vibration and pronunciation and all that kind of stuff. I totally understand. At the end of the day, like, we're all, we're not, we're, we're just trying. We're all aspiring. We talked about that last time, right? Inspiring to the light. That's all we can do. We can aspire. We try to do our, our best. We try to do our true will. Um, but all right, so that's, that's enough of, of, of that. Uh, oh, and actually, another thing to clarify. Uh, sometimes when I talk, I talk about the magician as if he's like the other. Like, as if it's something that you earn or something that you have to be or... Uh, you know, initiations that you have to take before you can be that. But the truth of the matter is when I use that term, I'm talking about you. I mean, everybody is doing magic all the time, whether they know it or not. And so since that's the case, you may as well get good at it, right? That's kind of how I look at it. And, and chances are there are more successful magicians than me in this room that don't have to do any of this stuff because they just have the right mindset. And that's, again, why I keep going back to mindset, because everything begins in the mind and everything ends in the mind. Um, so now, also, we know when we look at, uh, you know, uh, quantum physics experiments and the like, uh, things, famous things like the, you know, double split experiment or random number generators, we know, we know, and also when we talk about Dr. Moto a little bit, we, we know that our consciousness ch ch changes reality. We have an influence on the outcome. We are collapsing the wave functions and so on. Um, and ultimately, what's important to take away from that is it is the observer who is uh, manifesting reality, or more to the point, is the, um, the lens through which reality becomes manifest. At least to you, at least to you, right? Because it's your life. Uh, but again, we were talking about mindset, and again, uh, some of that has to do with uh, the idea of synchronicity. I think we touched on this before, but I don't know if it landed quite right. Uh, the idea of synchronicity being meaningful coincidence. And 
from our magical perspective, our magical practice, we know that those are meaningful coincidences that are the cause and effect from the operations that we did. Or at least we believe that that's the case, or, or however you want to tell yourself. Um, but ultimately, it could be a coincidence, it could be a one in a million coincidence, but at what point are there so many coincidences that there aren't coincidences anymore? That's really what I'd like you to think about. When you have that many, or you know, when, when you talk to other magicians who have made it their practice and the stuff works, and uh, anyway, that, that's, that's kind of getting neither here nor there, there, but the idea, more to the point with, with mentalism, is that, uh, and we were talking about this a little bit too, the idea of faith, but more to the point, I would say that things like fear and doubt are magic killers. And so it does not behoove you to feel, uh, to, so doubt and even, even hope to a certain extent, are, are ev hope is evidence of doubt because, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, as opposed to going forth with the confidence in your higher self, in your unconscious self to do what needs to be done to get to make the thing happen the way that it needs to happen and that's just how it works and so uh, one of the things I don't know if I really want to go into it today but I, I kind of recommend maybe you look into it there are certain schools of thought uh, towards um, sort of ranking emotional states uh, people even describe sort of I don't know arbitrary numbers to them or, or so but like you like where the lowest would be shame and up at the highest, you'd have like joy and peace and enlightenment and things like that. And they describe numbers. There, I, I, I couldn't find who, who was the original source from it because people seem to use it and reuse it. But I, um, I'll, I'll put a clip up. Uh, and like that, for, so for me, that's good. Um, it's a good meditation tool or at least a good conceptual tool where you're like, if you feel this way, whether you want your consciousness to be contracting or expanding, Typically, we want to be expanding, we're seeking enlightenment and, and the like. And so you can say, well, you know, if I have been feeling anger, the next step up would be pride or something. Can you find a way to get that and then to get to the next one and to get to the next one, that kind of stuff. So that's just something to think about when we're talking about mindset because there's all different kinds of ways to talk about it. Um, but um, so moving on a little bit more now that we're getting into kind of what we're doing, um, I think it's important that we discuss the concept of the sacred. Like, what is sacred? What makes a thing sacred? And in, in my mind, um, we would define sacred as a, a thing, an object or an action, so to speak, uh, that would have only one function, um, especially if that would be a spiritual function. So, for example, like a rosary, right? Has only one function, you pray the rosary, but it's a spiritual function, so it's therefore that much more sacred. Uh, I would additionally say, that it would be particularly sacred if only one person is allowed to use it. It's your rosary, not, uh, I can't touch it. Or, uh, and definitely, definitely sacred if it has been consecrated for that purpose. And we can talk about consecration a little bit more, but that's more uh, a way of um, ritually charging an object uh, and declaring it to be sacred. So that, like for instance, these, these are my, my uh, magic weapons. Um, and they are sacred. You are not allowed to touch them. I won't let you touch them. Uh, there's stuff that you can and there's stuff that you can't. And my stuff, you're not allowed to. Do I really, 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 really care? Not exactly. But I'm following in tradition and there's something to be said about getting your energy mixed up with other people and stuff like that. And so there's also things that you can do to cleanse you know, purify things. Yeah, you may have to reconsecrate it. What do you guys came up here and touched my wand? I have to go home and reconsecrate it. That's just how it goes. Um, but um, so when we're thinking about the sacred, now we come down to okay, well, these objects are sacred, but why? So what? What? To what end? Or what point? Or whatever. And so probably the best way to sort of demystify some of this mysticism, uh, we'll talk about. Um, and again, I can't remember where I got this from. I'm just, watching some YouTube conversations with a bunch of magicians or whatever, and one of them talked about the concept of, here we go, of romty dump and poof. Romty dump and poof. What is romty dump and poof? All right, so to them, or to this guy, whatever, the idea of romty dump is, romty dump is the, the, uh, the spectacle, the show, the, um, the robes and the wand and the incense and the, all, all this stuff, all the stuff that you would use to create the mood, Create the, um, or more to the point, like, and of course, it, 
It's not to say that they're not important. They don't have correspondences. All the correspondences, that's all important. Stuff is important to understand. But at the end of the day, really what you're doing is you're doing a romp to dump. You're trying to get your, you could argue trying to get your conscious mind out of the way so that you can communicate with the unconscious mind. So while you're keeping yourself busy, waving wands around and walking in circles or reciting mantras or whatever it is, like um, that allows for the poof. While you're busy with romp de dom poof happens. And poof isn't something that you force. Poof is what happens when you work focusing. That law of least resistance we were talking about, or like the set it and forget it. It's, it's kind of that thing, uh, but more to the point where specifically in ritual, ritual, um, ritual use. But um, okay, so um, I guess moving on. So that's, that's the idea. You can kind of think about it is like, is, it's all kind? I, I don't want to say it's bullshit. It's not bullshit. I mean, we put a lot into this stuff because it means so much. But the idea is that, is that really what does it? Is it really the wand that does it? Or is it the mental state that I achieve when I'm wielding the wand? I think that's more important. I think you guys can kind of understand what I'm saying when I'm saying that. Um, but we would also say, or we could also, um, we could argue that what makes, or, or the property, what makes the property of like a sacred object, for instance, is it's been charged. It has been charged with both energy and intention. And in a way, intention is perhaps the more important of those two. Um, but um, essentially, it has been charged with the light. And I know we spent a lot of time talking about the light, the mana, kundalini. Oh, it has a hundred different names, right? Chi is another good one. Um, but when we were talking about we were talking about mana as being sort of a threefold definition of um, you know, mana is both the matrix that articulates reality. Mana is uh, the energy that shapes phenomena and is shaped by phenomena, and energy is any act of consciousness, or mana is any act of consciousness. Remember that, it's all the three things at once. So in a sense, by combining those, by, by charging the item, it becomes something more. It's not just a dagger anymore. This is now my air dagger, and what I would use to do air operations. And I'll do one today for you guys. Um, or I'll at least incorporate it as part of the ritual. Um, but another thing, all right, so another way to talk about this when we talk about items being charged, because it doesn't just have to be, you know, a magic item that you create. All kinds of stuff get charged. Crystals are really, really good. Well, we know what we're talking about with crystals, right? Especially when, um, okay, uh, a good magician friend of mine, Freighter Superavo, he calls this womp womp, right? When you pick up you pick up an item that's been charged and it feels heavier than it should. You know what I'm talking about? So that maybe you do, maybe you don't. But when something feels heavier than it should, is a good indication that it has been charged with energy. The idea is perhaps it is your sensitivity, your uh, more, you know, uh, esoteric, psychic, however you want to call it. That's what's feeling the heaviness. Where in your mundane mind, that still weighs three pounds and two ounces. It doesn't matter how much energy or whatever you put into it, it's still gonna weigh the same, but your perceptions, our perceptions, our higher perceptions may be more may subtle and right? pick up this stuff, the subtle energies and that kind of stuff. And again, this is theory. I, I, I can't measure this, although I think some of the IONS guys are starting to measure this stuff a little better. Um, but anyway, so like I said, heavier than it should be. But the other, uh, the other thing uh, we were talking about with, um, the idea of it being mine and you can't touch it or whatever, that's kind of what makes it sacred. It's, it's by obeying those rules, by me not letting you touch it is more what makes it sacred. As opposed to, man, maybe, maybe you shouldn't or what, whatever. Um, but I would, I would argue that you, you would not want anybody touching your magic stuff that you wouldn't let touch you intimately, right? Like, it's kind of like, you know, I don't want you, you know, I wouldn't want you touching me down there or whatever, that kind of thing. It's, it's sort of the same thing. So like, so and, and actually, all right, I guess I'll, I'll just review these real quick, just so you know what I'm talking about. All right. So um, as far as, all right. So um, not just ceremonial magicians, you'll see this in the wicked traditions as well. Um, but um, so for instance, and each of these items that are very special to me, they all have an element of being a gift to them, which is very important to me when I'm creating magical items. 
But um, like, so for instance, the um, most classic, or I don't know, probably the one you recognize the most would be the pentacle or the, uh, the pentacle or the pentagram or however you want to put it. Um, but essentially it is the magic weapon or magic tool that is associated with earth. And so this is for grounding, protection. Um, for instance, if I, f I feel sick or whatever, I can just sit and hold this and meditate with it for a while and I feel better because it grounds me. Um, the second um, would be the uh, associated with, air, well, not the second, this second, uh, associated with air, uh, the air dagger. Uh, this would be involved, or you would use this for air operations, stuff that you would be thinking and doing mentally, that kind of stuff. Uh, but again, remember, air ties to the intellect. Where the third, uh, and this is probably a little, a little bigger than your traditional wand, um, but uh, so this would be associated with fire, right? Fire wand. Uh, and you would also uh, perhaps use this or anything uh, having to do with will, either rejecting will or in inhabiting will, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the final uh, of the four is the cup or the chalice. Um, and that's water, obviously, right? So um, you can use these in all kinds of different ways. Uh, I will use them today when I'm doing some of the pentagrams ritual stuff we'll be doing. Uh, but you can, for instance, the chalice is a great place to put charged water. We'll get into the Eucharistic stuff a little bit more uh, as we get into this. Um, I, I, for the most part, I just kind of want to touch on them because there's so much to each one of them and it's each is its own... <laughs> Each is his own experience. I've spent weeks, if not months, on each one of these items. So there's, there's a lot to them. But um, more to the point, um, or less, I don't know. Another way to think about this, though, is it's not just, it doesn't have to be sword, it doesn't have to be wand, it doesn't have to be, you know, there are all kinds of correspondences that, res that uh, tie to the different elements. And a really, really great one that has absolutely nothing to do with the Western traditions, uh, but uses the same rules and the same format, is what we would call like the tea ceremony. The Chinese or Japanese tea ceremony is it essentially has an altar. It combines the four elements. In fact, it's very much about combining the four elements and specifically, specifically about instilling qi into the water. It is a charging operation. And we have uh, we have a, another magician friend who really, 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 really knows the tea ceremony like really, really well. And we incorporated it into a ritual, which was awesome. It was awesome because we combined Eastern and Western magic. And you can read about it on my blog if you want. Um, but, uh, okay, uh, where's, okay, so another thing about uh, sacredness uh, that relates to this is the idea of secrets, right? A secret is sacred. And we can see that just based on what makes a thing sacred, how many people can have it, who can use it, that, that kind of thing. And so the idea is, Occult magic has a lot of secrets. I know some and I can't tell you them, uh, but everything that I can share, I share. I absolutely share because I feel like, how do I put this? Okay. Um, a lot of these uh, occult groups, so to speak, uh, have known this stuff for a long time. They've known this stuff for a long time. And I ask myself, did Keeping the light a secret, so much so to, that to the point that everyone forgot it was there, do anybody any favors? And I would say probably not. I look at the state of the world and I say, I wish so many more people knew what I knew. And so to me, I'm just like, well, look, get it out there. And I, know, I understand, I totally understand there's probably magicians out there who'd be really, really mad about some of the things that I might share with you guys. And, and to me, I'm like, I want you to do your true wills. I want to do my true will, and I want, if I can, help you find yours. Uh, even if it's just, just one little thing that I said that set you on the path, that's good enough for me. And so, in, in that respect, the light is for all. And that's another one of those secrets. Everybody can, can own it, everyone can claim it, everyone can wield it. Maybe not own it, but everybody, everyone has the authority, the divine spark within. Everyone has it and the light is yours too. And so, you know, I mean, 
I don't want to get off topic with, with with that kind of stuff. But that 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 ex, that to me um, is very very important and kind of why I want to do this. Uh, mostly, you know, I just want to spread the joy around. It brings me so much joy. I feel so like like I, the challenges that used to plague my life seem so distant now because circumstance are, is not what I used to think it was. And I always, there was always new options and always new things that you can do. And with the secret of magic, it's like there, there's kind of nothing you can't. You just need the imagination for it. And all right, so anyway, now, now I feel like I'm rambling. Um, but essentially, okay, so when we're talking about the sacred, probably uh, best advice that I can give you, at least the advice that I kind of took for myself, is um, that sacred mindset one of the best ways, I suppose, to either engender or at least um, uh, be moving in that direction is the idea of, like, of not taking shortcuts. Shortcuts are not, if you can do it the hard way and it'll be better, you do it that way. I mean, obviously, you, you might not have the right color candle, you might not have the right incense, blah, 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 blah. There's all kinds of stuff that you can, that there are shortcuts in the context. But the idea is if you don't have to, don't, because it brings that much more energy into whatever it is that you're doing. You've put that much more work into it. You've pre-charged it that much more. And we'll talk about pre-charging a little more as we get into it. Um, but um, for me, it's always about shooting, like swinging for the fences and going for something epic. It wasn't worth it for me if it wasn't epic. If it didn't make you like go, whoa, I can't believe we did that or whatever, it wasn't worth it. 22 minutes. Left. Okay, excellent. Good. So, um, all right. So uh, then, basic based on that, um, the other side of that coin is what happens when you start having success. You start building your successes and that stuff. That's a new ego trap that a lot of magicians fall into right away. So I won't warn you about it before you start having successes because I absolutely believe you all will. I've designed this so that you will. But anyway. Um, the idea of success is, I probably just fell into it right there, is the ego trap, right? The ego trap. Um, uh, the idea is like, once you have successes, you're like, yeah, let's go, right? Now I'm awesome. And that's the biggest danger, because that is probably when you're going to first start making your biggest mistakes, and that's when you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do some demon work or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, th this is a long, slow process. Um, but some people have more talent than others, and some people already are doing this stuff. They're already doing their stuff, and it just helps to have these concepts. But essentially, really what it comes down to um, is, all right, so that ego trap, I'm gonna, let's see if I can take the advice that I gave myself when I fall into it, which is, um, oh, we talked about him. We talked about Joe uh two classes ago. Another one of those great quotes he requotes uh, is, um, where is it? Oh, uh, transform... Transform your pride into dignity. And I think that is the key, right? Okay, yeah, you're great. So what? You know, there's all these other great people. Like, you're still a mouse on some dude's shoe. You know what I mean? Or whatever. So um, anyway, um, and that, that really gets down to what's the point of this all? Why do we do this stuff, right? Most magicians early on, tend to get in magic for one of three reasons. Money, power, sex. All of which are kind of boring to me. Uh, that being said, not that, because I, that those don't interest me in the same way, I should say. I like all of those things, but uh, they don't interest me in the same way. What interests me is what the magicians would call the great work. That's what we mean when we say the great work. It is this lifelong pursuit of magic in the attempt to accomplish your true will, whatever that is, whatever that form that takes, whatever that looks like. And I do, I do believe that that's not like so necessarily some major great destiny goal, although it could be. Uh, I think that you can always do your true will in the moment. You can always take control again, and you can always start a new path at any time, at anywhere, you can change on a dime. And we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more when we, we talk um, some of these other concepts out. Uh, but also uh, the, the sunum bonum is in the way that that's called the great work. And that's really what, that's, once you start doing that stuff, then the money, power, and sex, 
that stuff's becoming a lot less important. So, um, which is fine. That's how you, where you want to get get started. That's fine. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying once you start doing the work, that stuff doesn't seem to matter so much anymore.